I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter number 3. And we're going to continue right along in our journey through this book. Um, Rusty, thank you, brother, for sharing. And no, I did not tell him he had 30 seconds. Uh, I think you know that. I did urge him to land the plane at some point, and he did. So, uh, as you hope I will do every Sunday. Glad to see everyone. We have a lot of our um, folks away at a conference uh, this morning and some others uh, who are not feeling well. But I, I trust you're doing good this morning and so glad uh, that you're here in the Lord's house. Genesis chapter number three. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the chair in front of you. I failed to write down the page number uh, for you, but <clears throat> it's the first book of the Bible. And the big numbers are the chapter numbers, if you're not familiar at all with Scripture. So chapter 3 comes early in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of, its, eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it, this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, <clears throat> I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain shall you bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband." But he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you. And you shall eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now let us reach out. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man 
And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Would you pray with me, please? Father, as we come to this chapter in the Bible, Lord, we are at, without question, the saddest chapter in all of Scripture. For here we read what plunged humanity into ruin. Here we discover the root of our brokenness and the brokenness that we see around us. But here we see the answer. We see the cure. We see the hope. Albeit in seed form, we see the beginning, God, of your supernatural plan to redeem sinners. So would you now open our eyes in these moments that we have to hear your word and see this truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 3 explains why everyone and everything is broken. Now, let's be honest. You may not want to think of yourself as broken. Most of us don't. And some can be quite adept at covering their brokenness. Some learn through life how to conceal their brokenness. And even Christians who li live with the lingering effects, the residual effects of the curse and sin and have their, our struggles, our battles, uh, we too can become very good at covering our brokenness and our need of the Lord. This chapter deals with that unpopular subject of sin. We don't mind hearing about someone else's sin, but we'd rather not talk about our own. In fact, we rarely say words like, I have sinned or I am a sinner. We find it easier to say, I've got some struggles or I have a problem. Or that's just kind of the way I was brought up and that's the way I have always acted and reacted. We, we need to learn, do we not, what Scripture says about the doctrine of sin. Up to this point, Adam and Eve had, have all they need. They're in paradise. They have each other. They have a perfect marriage. They live in a beautiful garden. Life is good. There's no sickness, there's no disease, there's no threat of death. There's no concept of death, no concept of illness. Life is as good as life could be. They only know perfect life. But then, and I realize that it was a long chapter to read, but very important that we hear the word of the Lord. And in this, in this chapter, in this one chapter, we see the root of brokenness because the serpent enters the picture. And this serpent, as we saw in, or as you heard, if you were listening to the scripture, is not only crafty, but this serpent speaks. Now, if you say, well, how does a serpent speak? There could be a lot of theories behind that. I would tell you that God created Adam and Eve as adults. They, they were not born. They were created in, in an adult state, as it were. The animals that were around them that Adam had named, was a, they were in a perfect world. It, it, our minds really cannot comprehend what that world was like, but it was a perfect world. And so... Perhaps they had not heard an animal speak, but they would not have thought it the most unusual thing as perhaps, well, not perhaps, we would, right? If we heard an animal speak to us, we would, we would think something is wrong with us or we're hearing things or someone's playing a trick on us. But I don't think for Adam and Eve that this was as strange as it is when when we are reading these words, some evil being took possession of this serpent, not a serpent that would have been feared because there was no reason to fear it. 
An evil being that we know from the rest of Scripture is none other than the old serpent. And this old serpent questions the goodness of God. In fact, he will lie about the goodness of God. And if you say, well, how do we emphatically know that this is the devil speaking through this serpent? Well, just a, a, a little lesson in Bible study. While there are so many good books that we should and could consult as we read our Bibles, commentaries are useful, concordances are useful, listening to other sermons are, are helpful. But the Bible helps us understand the Bible. And so it takes time to read the Bible. It, uh, it takes time to study God's Word. But as you read Scripture, and you have to get really um, to the end of the Bible to see this, but in Revelation 12, 9, this being is described in detail. So you might want to jot that verse down, Revelation 12, 9, that speaks of the ancient serpent, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the world. So this is who's speaking through this serpent. And he is the reason that everyone and everything is broken. Satan, the old serpent, is what's behind it. So how does he work? Well, in this chapter of Genesis chapter 3, we see his tactics, and I'm going to tell you this now, and I'm going to tell you again, his tactics have rarely changed. They rarely change. In some form or another, the tactics that were used in that perfect environment are still used today. They're used against me. They're used against you. They're used against the people that you love, some of whom may be experiencing a lot of brokenness. So the first thing that we see in this chapter is that the devil twists God's good words. He twists them. God's good words are twisted. The devil craftily goes to work in the garden by twisting God's good words. And if you go back to chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, we've looked at this, but God had told the couple that they could eat of every tree in the garden except one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But what does the devil, the old serpent, craftily do? He twists God's word. He, he makes God seem harsh and restricting. And that comes out in verse number one. The serpent was more crafty than the their beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Very crafty, very subtle. Did God really say that to you? So he's beginning to cast the seed of doubt. Would God, Eve, keep something from you? Do we not have those thoughts that sometimes can enter our heads, our thinking processes? Would God really keep that from you? And so she begins to reason, is God good? Is God really good? I mean, did God actually say that? She doesn't know this is the old serpent. This is one of the creatures that God has made. And now she's hearing, does God want to keep us from being happy? I thought I was happy. I thought I had everything I needed. Maybe I don't. And the tactic, again, has worked so well that the devil uses this over and over and over. We entertain thoughts, do we not? I'm not happy. And if I had, and you can fill in that, you can fill in the blank, I, I'm just not happy, but... I thought I was happy, but I'm really not happy. I thought I had everything I needed in my family, but now that I've gotten to know her or I've gotten to know him or I've tasted this side of life or I've seen, and so you fill in the blank. I thought I was happy. I thought I had what I wanted and what I needed. And so we, we begin to, to reason and we begin to think, God's keeping me from something. And so doubt has been casted on God's word. It's been twisted. This is why everyone and everything is broken. Because the old serpent comes along and twists God's good words and makes us think different thoughts. The devil secondly lies about God's good words. And that comes out in verses 2 through 8. We've read the verses, but here's what's going on. The woman makes a pretty big mistake. 
she, she begins this conversation. And not only does she begin a conversation, and by the way, when you start talking to the devil, a train wreck is awaiting you, my friend. It's coming. You may cruise along, as, as Rusty very well said, to change the, the analogy, your ship may cruise along and the party may be good, the music may be good, and you may be having the time of your life, but there is a waterfall. There is destruction ahead. And so she begins this conversation. And if you look closely at verses 2 and 3, the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. She almost got it right. She almost remembered everything, but God had not said you shall not touch it. She added that. She came up with that. That was not the Lord's original instructions to her. And so it's as if she's already become convinced in her mind very quickly, God is unreasonable. God's asking more of me than I should be expected to do. He's harsh. He's keeping something from me. Why, God even said, don't touch it. Well, the Lord did not say, don't touch it. And now with the hook firmly set in her mouth, it's just a matter of time. And so she's ready for the lie. We're not always ready for a lie from Satan. We're, we, we have to be sometimes worked up to it. We have to be brought into where we're going to believe the lie. But the lie comes in verse 4. You will not surely die. You're not going to die. Where do you get that from? Who do you know that's ever died? You haven't died. Your husband hasn't died. None of these animals that God created, none of them have died. In fact, he, he goes on in verse 5. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. It's not enough that you're made in the image of God. Why, God's... What's so great about being made in his image? Eve, Adam, you can be like him. You can know what he knows. Just being made in his image, what, what is that? You can know what God knows. You can be like God, and then you can decide for yourself what's right and what's wrong. And so again, to repeat myself, this tactic is work, it works over and over and over. It's worked in my life, friends. It's worked in your life. The devil lies about the goodness of God. We slowly take the bait. We become our own God. And Paul, and you might want to jot this down, in the New Testament, in Romans 1.25, tells us of what we do. We exchange the truth of God for what? Does anyone know? The lie. We... Romans chapter 1, verse 25, is so explicit, it's so clear. We have all done that. We've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Here's truth. God's given us truth. Here, here, take this truth. Let me have the lie. And so the devil did his work craftily. He did his work quickly. And then he seems to just back up. He didn't have to do anything else. He, he's just sort of out of the picture now, or it's as if he's, he kind of slithers in the background, and he's going to watch the couple self-destruct. He doesn't need to do anything else. He's, he's casted doubt on God's word. He's accused God of lying, accused God of holding back on them. They could have so much more if God would just be not so harsh. And then... In verses 6 through 8, we, when she saw that the tree was good for food like the other trees in the garden that, um, that she and her husband had enjoyed, that, that now she could become like God. And so she took and she ate and she gave some to her husband. And he went right along with her. Adam should have stopped her. He could have stopped her. It's not as if he walked up on this after it had happened. She's, she's in the dialogue, but he's standing right there. It was really his role to step up and say, no, we're not listening to this. Something, I don't know what's going on, but something is wrong. God is too good. God's given us too much. 
And so for the men who are married in this room and for the, um, the men who face and the wives and the couples who face all the challenges and all the temptations that the world can throw at us and the devil can give, men, we have to stand up and we have to be men. And we have to say there are objective truths. There's the truth of God's word. And it, it's the, re, the role and responsibility of you as the male to be the spiritual leader of your home. And guys, I say this in love. I, I have nothing in my notes, nothing written in my Bible. But I say to you, if you're not leading your home spiritually, it's time to step back and say, why am I not doing it or why haven't I done it? And it, it's time to reach out to somebody, reach out to one of the pastors, reach out and say, I, I, maybe I need some help. I'm, I'm just sort of in this mode of passivity. I, I've just kind of been drifting along and just whatever. I mean, I come to church on Sunday, but if, if there's a rocking party on Saturday night or something going on, then I'm going to be right in that. With, I'm just going to drag my, my wife right along with me, going to make sure there's got, the kids are taken care of, but... We're just going to go right along with the world. And you're not leading your family. You're not being a man. You're being a spiritual wimp is what you're being. And so men have got to be the ones that stand up and say, this is wrong. He should have stopped her. He allowed her to sin. And he sinned right along with her. And then, again, in our text, we see they, they lost their childlike innocence. They were naked and unashamed. I'm not going to get in, into, the, into the details of that because it's just what the Bible says. The best way I understand that pre-fall is like little kids. Uh, th there's, a, there's that age of toddlers, uh, certainly babies, but even toddlers, they don't think anything of running through the house naked, right? They've jumped out of the bathtub and they just don't think about it. It's the, what are they? They're not concerned. So that's not a theology lesson, okay? I'm not trying to build too much into that. But I'm just telling you, prior to the fall, Adam and Eve, there, there's no shame. Now, there's, some, there's an awareness. There's an awareness that something is wrong. This innocence is gone. And they cover themselves. And in verse 8, their communion that they have enjoyed with God has turned to hiding. The, the joys of in, uh, the pleasures of knowing each other and knowing the created order, something is wrong. Their, their loss of innocence, everything and everyone, they are broken. Their world is broken. But while brokenness is a reality, and the residual effects can linger sometimes for a long time, in the life of a Christian who's not growing in the word and not fellowshipping with the church and not being discipled. It, it can last sometimes too long. But it's equally true that God will redeem all that's been broken. And that's what we need to focus on. For all that's broken, God will redeem. And that's what the rest of the chapter deals with. God doesn't give up on the couple. God could have banished them to hell and all of their descendants. God could have said, that's it. All of humanity could have been cursed and sent to hell. But God comes looking for the man. He calls to him. You see that in verse 9. He's avoiding God. He doesn't want God. And I, I can't prove this, but it's almost the picture that this was a, a regular occurrence for God and the man and the woman to to meet together and fellowship together and enjoy the presence of the Almighty as he would be with them in the garden. And now they're hiding. And so when, when the Lord is calling out, Adam, where are you? It's, he's, not, he's not like a, when we were children and we played hide and seek and we couldn't find somebody. Where are you? I give up. God, God knew where they, he was trying to draw him out. So he's actively pursuing him. But what happens? Well, the man begins to defend himself. He, he blames his wife. He had this wonderful, I'm just going to say, attractive, beautiful, gorgeous wife, a beautiful place to live. The, his world was perfect. 
But now, if you look at it in verse 12, what is, how does he refer to her? The woman you gave me. It's almost like I was okay till she came along. <laughs> I didn't have problems. Life was good. Had these animals. And the woman, God, by the way, you gave her to me. That's my problem. And this also isn't in my notes, and I don't need to chase any rabbit trails this morning, but that's another tactic of the devil, like to try to divide you in your marriage. Well, I married the wrong person, or just it goes on and on. The Lord turns to the woman in verse 13, and what does she do? She's like her husband. She does not take responsibility. So verse 14, God begins to judge. He begins to judge. He starts with the serpent, and just verses 14 through 19 shows that God, this first time we read about a curse in the Bible, God places a curse upon the world, the people, the animals, the plants, the very ground. And life is now hard. Life was good, but now life is hard. Sin has brought God's judgment, and man's going to die. Look at verse 19 again. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. You're going to die, Adam. That's what he's saying. Death, is, death has not been a reality. You don't even know what death is. But just so you know, I formed you from the dust, and you're going to return to the dust. That's news for Adam. You're going back to the dust. Now, does it mean that he immediately died? God had said, if you eat of this, you're going to die. Judgment does not always come swiftly, but it always comes, friend. And my brother Rusty, again, said it well. That, that ship is cruising towards a waterfall. It's coming. And so the Bible speaks of death in more than one way. It speaks of physical death, spiritual death, and the second death. Physical death was, was inevitable. It, it, you, you can even go over just a chapter or two in uh, chapter five and you can read of the, this name after name after name and then you, each time you read, and he died, and he died, and he died. And Adam heads the list. Adam would die. So there's physical death. We know about that, right? We've, we've all experienced loss. But then the Bible also speaks of spiritual death. And spiritual death is the state that every person born in Adam's race is born spiritually dead. Spiritual death, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul said, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. There's no spiritual heartbeat. There's no love for God. There's no love for a church. There's no love for the people of God. There's no interest in the Bible. Sin just is the natural, normal thing to do, and you enjoy sin. You, 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 you do things, and you may have a little bit of a guilty twinge, like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I should quit that. But, oh, everybody does it. It's just the way life is. And so it, it manifests itself in different ways, but spiritual death means ultimately that we're cut off from God. We have no fellowship with God. And then the Bible speaks about the second death. The second death or eternal death is the permanent, irreversible state of a person who dies physically while spiritually dead. May I say that again? A person who dies spiritually dead, unsaved, unreconciled to God, will experience what the Bible calls eternal or the second death. It is the permanent, irreversible state of being cut off from God. It's, it's eternity in a lake of fire. It is horrible beyond any words that any preacher can give. Revelation 20, verse 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Physical death, spiritual death. I may be speaking to someone this morning, you're spiritually dead. And if you die spiritually dead, what awaits you? 
The second death. Death is not the end. Funerals may give the impression it's over. She lived her life. He lived his life. No. That's, that's the earthly farewells. But there is life beyond this life. So God drove the man and the woman out of the garden in verses 23 and 24. And to keep them from living forever under a curse, he placed an angelic being to keep them from returning. So we need some good news very quickly. In verse 21, in the garden, God killed an animal. He made garments for the man and woman to cover their nakedness and deal with their sense of shame. This is foreshadowing Christ who would come, whom 1 Corinthians 15, 45 called the last Adam. The first Adam, colossal failure. The last Adam, where the first Adam failed, the second Adam or the last Adam succeeded. And why is everyone everything broken? Because of what the old serpent did. But what's the cure? It's that Jesus would come. And he would come to redeem sinners. And not just sinners, but all of creation. <clears throat> it's what Romans 8, 22 and 23, when it talks about all of creation groaning together in the pains of childbirth. And, and what was in that Christmas hymn, nor thorns infest the ground, joy to the world, the Lord has come. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. Thorns have infested the ground. All of creation has been cursed. But Jesus, the Redeemer, has come. And he rescues from sin. He rescues and saves all who will believe. This is the good news of the gospel. I want to close by asking you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And I would urge you on your own. I'm I'm not going to read all the verses, but just make a note. Romans 5 verse 12, really through the end of the chapter. But let me just read beginning a few verses in uh, chapter 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, And death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was the type of the one who was to come. But here it is. But the free gift... Verse 15, is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. The free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Friends, Jesus came to redeem us from brokenness. We don't have to live in brokenness. Jesus came to save sinners. He died on a cross. He rose from the dead. And it's it's simple. The gospel is so simple that a, a little child can understand it. And yet it's so deep that the angels in glory look into salvation, Peter says, to understand it. So simple that a little child can get it and understand it have you got it have you believed on jesus are you trusting in him if you're a christian is your life reflecting that you're growing in grace are there lingering effects of brokenness that need yet to be dealt with well let me tell you one way that that is dealt with and that's the gathered body of believers from the church it's the church god uses others People like us, people unlike us. He uses his word, he uses the church. It's important that we're gathered together. And one of the ways that we are encouraged is when we remember what Christ did for us. When we remember his perfect sacrifice for us. We remember his death. And we do that by coming to the Lord's table. And so in just a few moments, if you are a believer in Christ, a baptized believer in good standing with your church, then I'm going to invite you to make your way down and pick up one of these little trays and then return to your seat and we'll all partake of these 
elements together in just a moment. These elements that remind us of Christ's sacrifice. Please take your hymn book and let's turn to the very back of our hymn book. And this is our covenant. This is how we agree to live together. Please read it with me. Having, as we trust, been brought by divine grace to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to submit our lives wholeheartedly to him and having been baptized upon our profession of faith in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we do now, relying on his gracious aid, solemnly and joyfully renew our covenant with each other. We will work and pray for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We will walk together in brotherly love as do the members of a Christian church, exercise an affectionate care and watchfulness over each other, and faithfully admonish and entreat one another as occasion may require. We will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together nor neglect to pray for ourselves and others. We will endeavor to maintain family and personal devotions, to bring up all who are under our care in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and by a pure and loving example, to seek the salvation of our family and friends. We will rejoice at each other's happiness and endeavor with tenderness and sympathy to bear each other's burdens and sorrows. We will seek by divine aid to live carefully in the world, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, remembering that we have been buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. We will work together to maintain a faithful evangelical ministry in this church as we sustain its worship ordinances, discipline, and doctrines. We will contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel to all nations. We will, when we move from this place as soon as possible, unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. So as we come to the Lord's table, I know that there may be some for whom uh, coming down here is a challenge. There are also some tables in the back, but also uh, we have uh, some men that uh, if you'll just slip your hand up, they can bring it to you if, if you're if a mobility problem would hinder you from coming. Uh, anyone that want to just slip their hand up and Brother Keith's ready to bring this to you? Okay, seeing none, let's all stand together. And um, in just a moment, I'm going to pray. And after I pray, I'm going to invite you, please, to make your way down, pick up a tray, and return to your seat. Father, we ask and pray in Jesus' name that you would give us great insight into your word to to remember what we've seen in these holy scriptures about the tactics of satan and why everyone and everything is broken i pray lord as we engage people in conversations that we would not forget that the real problem the greatest problem everyone has is lostness and the only answer is a relationship with you lord jesus now as we come to the table as we partake of the fruit of the vine and of the wafers that remind us of the broken body of the Lord Jesus. We realize that ingesting these elements do not save us. They do not make us Christians. We receive this by grace. We receive this as a gift of your favor, as a reminder that Jesus paid it all, that even though we stumble, even though we have fallen, even though some may have had a terrible week, even though some may be fighting overwhelming battles and feeling like they're failure spiritually, Lord, we are not, our salvation does not rest 
and how hard we try or how good we are. It rests on the perfect work of Jesus. So we say hallelujah, and we receive this joyfully. In your name we pray. Amen. Please come or use the tables in the back of the sanctuary. Amen.